Gil. Here we are again. It's great to be with you on the third uh, tour. It's that a real we're pleasure. And here we can hear the bells uh, ringing out here in Jerusalem exactly at 4 o'clock uh, in Jerusalem. 4 p.m. 4 p.m., that's right. I'm not sure where the viewers are. They could be uh, from anywhere, really, and it could be morning, evening. In any case, we're here in Jerusalem uh, in the afternoon on our third uh, B'nai B'rith live tourism uh, pr pilot project, and it's great to be here again with you. Um, what we're going to do, do today, uh, the, the plan that you've laid out for us, is to go to some very significant sites Absolutely. here on Mount Zion. And uh, these sites are uh, all around us now, and, and uh, also uh, a bit further away, we'll be walking to them. And uh, we're here right near the Cenaculum, and you're going to tell us more about it, but awesome. that's the, the room of the Last Supper. Uh, just over here is also the tomb of King David, and you see his statue right behind us. Uh, and we'll also be going to the, the tomb of Oscar Schindler, to the grave of Oscar Schindler, and, and many other points uh, along the way. So uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, uh, Gil, and uh, you'll lead us through the tour. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure meeting you again for our third program. Today's a real, really significant tour. As we are traveling today for a few hours in a very concise area, but extremely important. Important for the three major religions of monotheism, meaning 54 to 55% of mankind today in the world. And Mount Zion clearly represents a peaceful island in the Middle East. As peaceful as is Israel without the general media coverage looking for the troubles wherever they are. Mount Zion is one of the names given to Jerusalem. Jerusalem carries the name of Zion, Zion in Hebrew, which means Location. This is the location of God. And the Bible says something very interesting. Bible says, Ki mitzion tetzet Torah udvar Hashem Mirushalayim in the Old Testament. From Zion, the law will come from. And the message will spread from Jerusalem. And the story is around the Jewish people who came back to his land from exile, from Passover story. As you remember, for hundreds of years, our people were slaves in Egypt. Next week will be Passover in America, in Australia, in Israel. And we will remember these years, these centuries of slavery and the time the Jewish people came back to its land. From that very moment, we crossed the Jordan River. The people was led by prophets. There are no nation in the world history led by prophets who create a political system which was very interesting, connecting between the Shalom. connecting between God's vision and a decent way to manage a country, including judges, justice, and police. The leader had a direct connection to the unique gods and the police and judges were here to make sure that the biblical law is respected. This is the sense of tolerance. This is the sense of biblical democracy in those days. But the day came, the day came where the, the day came where the people of Israel decided that they would like to become like each and every nation in the world, meaning having a king. And we did not have a king. You, of course, remember Moses. The man was born in Egypt. 
and from Egypt. He took out the people of Israel out of slavery and Passover is about our people becoming free. Moses carried that terrible burden to bring the people, hundreds of thousands, some people say three million, for 40 years in the desert, but didn't have the chance to step in the land. For some reason, your rabbis, your priests will explain. And Moses was replaced when he passed away on the Jordanian side of the Jordan River by Joshua. Prophet Joshua was the first prophet. And for hundreds of years, Jewish people had a prophet for that connection until the day they came to Prophet Samuel. And they said to Samuel, we respect your position. You have a direct connection to God, but we want a real king. It could have been a, an offensive request. The prophet asked God what to do. And God said to them, this won't be good for them. But if they want a king, they should have a king. It might not be the best for that nation, but they need to go through it, to go to, through this process to understand why kingdom is not the best. And they decided, he, God explained him how to choose a king. And that's the way a man named Saul was made king of Israel. Of course, as God predicted to Prophet Samuel, this will turn very bad. King Saul will be assassinated. But meanwhile, he was the king, a young Jewish shepherd, born in Bethlehem, which I hope will be for us a place we will tour together in the coming program. These young shepherds from Bethlehem felt terribly offended by this Philistine aggression on a daily base. Philistine, capital city, Gaza. Don't look for connection with today, or maybe yes. And this aggression on the Jewish soil, on the land of Judah, by foreign army, were unpleasant to King David, in those days a shepherd. And he decided to fight this strong man, and he won. And the day he defeated Goliath, as we all remember, the people of Israel understood who is David, and they loved David when Saul was still a king. So this is a very complicated saga. But after Saul was killed, after Saul was killed, the king David was made king, and he moved from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, he was ruling a kingdom in Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. And finally, at the end of his life, King David, who lived here and created Jerusalem, King David came here and was living on the slope of Mount Zion and later on buried here. But with your permission, I would like, of course, we will answer, we will receive many questions and I we should, remind, we should remind the viewers to send in their questions. This, we already have several questions, but with your permission, I would like to take advantage of the fact some indoor spots are still open. And with your permission, delay the question about the instrument Ido is now playing about. This is called Anthem, and we listen and we enjoy this young man coming from Jerusalem, brought to Mount Zion, the island of peace. This wonderful drum. And I hope in the coming hour, if Ido is still in the vicinity, we'll have a little bit more time to enjoy what is he producing now. Let's climb upstairs, up on King David grave. <laughs> Пасха идет, пасха Je suis là, je t'aime. 
לשבת במיקרופון של נתן לסטירה. I invite you to come in. Please. We, we are not alone today, as you could guess. And our cameraman will be standing here, so we will be able. We are now standing in a very important room. But before we describe this room, I would like you to pay attention at this staircase down there, at the very right end of this room. This staircase is leading to another room, right down below, which is the place where King David is buried. I will try to show it to you later from the lower window but from this moment you can understand how important is this place where we stand. We will head toward the olive tree. And it is a pleasure for me to invite you into this room which is considered by all Christians being the place where Jesus had his last supper. What do we talk about? We keep in mind, first of all, in those days, you have to remember Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi named Yeshua. He came from Galilee. In those days, there was a temple in Jerusalem, the house of God for all nations. What was to be a Jew? As you were wondering, Alan, in those days, Judaism was slightly different. In those days, being a Jew was keeping kosher, the way we understand keeping kosher, maybe not exactly like today, but there was a certain way, certain dietetics we had to respect. There was a Jewish calendar, which is based on the central daily, on the central day named Shabbat. Day off, the day we don't work, the day we are together with the families, with the friends, dealing with spiritual and family affairs, disconnected from our daily life. And the, day, and, and the day that signifies God's rule in the world. Absolutely. And freedom. Six days, six days and then stop. Agreed. The absolutely. And this is the day which is the evidence for human beings that they can be free, they're not slave of any work. Of course you need to prepare Shabbat. And as we say in our books, you eat on Shabbat what you have cooked the days before. So we have to give sense to our life, but we have to know to stop and give a break. And beside Shabbat are three holidays in the year where Jewish people will go to the house of God, to the very place where God revealed himself to Abraham. This is the place where God asked Abraham to offer is son Isaac. And coming to that hill, gathering together, meeting people from different nations is the key story. Jesus was a rabbi. He was uh, born in Nazareth, which is lower Galilee today, in between Tiberias and Haifa. Small village, probably no more than 30 families. When he was a bit older, in his 20s, depending on which, who you ask. There's some people are not clear about the calendar. Jesus walked to the Sea of Galilee. And up north, northern, the city of Tiberias, he will stay there for several years. He will work with the people and he will teach 
his understanding of the Bible. This was not hardline Judaism. It was closer to what we would call something like Reform Judaism, meaning not too heavy practice, but a deep philosophical feeling of ethics, morality, behavior. And the day will come, he will walk to Jerusalem along the Jordan River, Rift Valley, and reach Jerusalem for Passover, which is the day we celebrate all together on a large table, families, friends, this moment we left Egypt and became a free nation. Think about Afro-American remembering the way they were captured by merchants in Africa, moved with chains on boats to the American continent and later on these people will be turned to slavery. And this is what Jesus came to commemorate in the city of Jerusalem. And when he was commemorating in the city of Jerusalem, he had his Last Supper in an upper room, which is an upper floor, to a building. They were commemorating. And this is the place they had this dinner. When the dinner was over, and you remember these beautiful paintings about the Last Supper. The room is named Cenaculum. And Jesus, from here, walked down the slopes of Mount Zion, you will see later, and he went to sleep his last night on the slopes of Mount of Olives. There, Jesus was arrested by the Roman. He was arrested as a Jewish rabbi. And like many Jews, he was condemned to death, carried a cross all the way around the city and crucified, like many Jews, between 50 to 200 a year, every year. For many years, the people who believed, the people who believed Jesus was the Messiah, were a group in the Jewish community. They were a group in the Jewish community. And these people were called Judeo-Christians. For many years, For many years, for many years, for hundreds of years, this was a group among the Jewish nation, Judeo-Christian. As a matter of fact, we could have been and remained one people. But what happened? In the fourth century, one first Roman emperor recognized this small group as a separate religion and made it the Roman Empire religion and started to fight ancient archaic Judaism. So Christianity was made a separate religion and what they did was that they started to convert people to their faith without imposing learning the holy books, the Bible. And because they did not go through a basic conversion process, Christianity decided that anyone who wished to become Christian can be a Christian. So the tension with the synagogues turned stronger and stronger, and that's the way we split. We have to think about it very often, because think about it, but in the last 2,000 years, 
most of Jewish casualties. Jewish people who didn't end up their life by natural ways, they were killed for being Jews, were killed by Christianity. And this is very interesting, we tend to forget it because in the last 100th century, the conflict between the state and Israel and some neighbor country can give us the feeling that the problem is mainly with Islam, but figures are very different. And you remember we were last week in the Holocaust Memorial and we mentioned millions of Jews. They were massacred all over the history. And this place, the Cenaculum, is the place where pilgrims of all kind come to commemorate Jesus' Last Supper, which is the beginning, the starting step of Jesus' passion, Jesus' suffering. It goes from here, Mount Zion, to the crucifixion on Mount Golgotha. Then Jesus will be buried. What is the old story about? It is clearly a story about Mount Zion, because the Bible says that the day will come and God will give us one of his descendants and he will be the savior of mankind. There won't be no more wars, no more bloodshed, no more languages will separate human beings. Dead people will resurrect from their graves and this will happen when Messiah will come. And the question is today, who is the Messiah? Of course, who am I here? We have people watching us from different denominations in each one with his own belief or respect. The Bible is very clear. To be the Messiah, you have to be descendant of King David. This is why Christians say to the Jews, Jesus is the Messiah. And the Jews say to the Christian, yes, he is a descendant, but <coughs> we are still waiting for resurrection. We are still waiting for peace in the world. And when things happen, then we can recognize they have happened. Later on, Islam, Islam, a new generation born in the 7th century after Christ, Islam recognized both David and Jesus as prophets. And this is what happened here. And the Muslim here, here at the 7th century, the Muslim came here, and I would like to show you from here, from the door, that the Muslim turned this room into a mosque. So think about it. The room was turned, the room has been turned in the very same time by The room was turned by the Muslim into a mosque. And for many years, it has been a central mosque in the city of Jerusalem and Mount Zion. Six years ago, the decision was to give this room back to Vatican. And when the Pope the last Pope, Benedictus XVI, came to Jerusalem. This room has been given back to him. Right down below is King David's grave. But if you wish to enjoy the view, why not climb up the roof and enjoy the view before I take you downstairs to King David's grave. And you will discover something fascinating. The imbrication of three religions in the very same building. And you know what? It works. And people pray together. Look at here. We have another open air mirab. The mirab you can see here, as you know, Muslim are not fond of idolatry. To the very extent, Jewish people can go and pray in a mosque. Because there's no doubt. In this place, people worship one unique God. This is called mihrab in Arabic. And mihrab is giving us what we call in Quran, Qibla. Qibla is the direction of Mecca. So what would be the difference here between three religions representing 
55% of human mankind is only the direction of your prayer to the unique God. If you stand here and you see the man praying towards this direction, he's a Muslim. If he's praying towards this direction, he's a Christian. Thank you for the bell. 430. If he's praying this direction, he's praying towards Jerusalem temple, he's a Jew. The Jews pray over around the temple and towards Jerusalem from any spot in the world. The Muslim towards Mecca, their holy city. The Christian do not pray toward a place, but toward the east, because east for Christian is sunrise. And the sunrise announces a new day, a new light, as they consider the New Testament to be a new light over the old book. So there is a way to understand. I would say that our common heritage among the three religions, Alan, is 98%. And small nuances, I'm not talking now about cultural behavior, depending on the geography. Muslim from North Africa are not Muslim from Turkey or Afghanistan, Pakistan or US. The same for Christian. And Christian in Eastern Europe have different habits than Lutheran or Protestant Christian in Northern America or Germany. The same for Latin Catholic in South America, etc. Similar for Jewish people. And a Jew is a citizen of his own country. What does look more American than a Jew in America, or more French than a Jew in France, or more Israeli than a Jew in Israel? The Jew copes with the land he stays, but the faith remains the faith. I invite you, let's climb on top. The view is nice. So you have asked many questions, Alan, before we started this uh, broadcast today. And it's a pleasure to develop and answer to some of your questions right now as we are climbing here on the roof of King David Grave. The grave and the synagogue. What a roof! Shit! What a roof! And from here. We can watch at the southern and eastern part of Jerusalem and from there you can see the separation wall between Israel and the Palestinian state, Palestinian Authority. But of course, together we're going to walk towards Mount Zion. Mount Zion is facing here the national graveyard at Mount of Olives, hundreds of thousands of graves, Jewish people there. And we will ask our technical officer, can you zoom on that graveyard? And here we can see. Here we can see the graves of Jews who decided all over the history to be buried here in Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, for the day, for the D-Day, the day Messiah will come, climbing down the hill on the slopes of Mount of Olives, and a resurrection should happen from this day. The people of Israel will know he is the Messiah. For the Christian, they will name him Jesus. The Muslim will believe this is Muhammad to be back. Because the Bible says clearly there's only one Messiah for all of us. So why should one kill the other? 
Why should there be any war between believers if we all believe in one God and if we all do believe in Messiah to come and resurrection to happen afterwards? When we view the old city walls here, you understand that this was a privileged location in the days we had no control in the days we had no control of the old city when Jordan when Jordan had stolen from us the old city of Jerusalem in the year 1948 and for 19 years the state of Israel, the Jewish nation, the Jewish world find itself orphaned from its beloved city. I remind you the census in 1860. 1860, the British, French, Austrian and American had a census here in Jerusalem. The population in the old city of Jerusalem was 56% Jewish, 28% Christian. This is to say that we have not only right and title, but we were the strong majority guaranteeing the existence of minor minorities in Jerusalem. And this is what we do believe in. And in those days, the second president of Israel, President Ben Zvi, as we could not in the 50s access, at the end of the 50s, access to the Western Wall and to the Temple on these three days of pilgrimage. So this was the time. This was the time Jewish people had to come here upon King David roof and from the roof. Look at what could be seen from the Temple. And if you can lift up this camera, if you can lift it up, you will be able to view the temple, the temple mount, and you'll be able to view the white dome of the Jewish synagogue, the central synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem. What a view, what a magnificent view. If you succeed with the camera to have a look at this barren hill far away from here, you see the antenna. And there is the mountain named Mount Azazel. And this is the place where the high priest would walk to after he left the temple, walking from the temple in Yom Kippur, with a scapegoat and the goat was thrown from the top hill there and rolled down the valley carrying with him the sins of Israel. No. So, here, here is a church. This is a Catholic German Benedictine Catholic. When I said German, so you understand that these were the allied people to the Turks, to the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. When I say R German Catholic Benedictine, you understand we deal with aesthetics. Benedictine order.
is among the Christian. The one who believes that prayer has to be in dignity, solemnity, the music, the Gregorian songs. And this is the church named the Dormition to commemorate the place where they believe Mary, Jesus' mother, felt asleep. And this is what happened to her after Jesus died, after mourning Jesus, but before she was carried by angels to heaven, what Christians call Assumption. Here is a plaque. And the plaque here is a commemoration. Is a commemoration for those who gave their life fighting for the liberation of the old city of Jerusalem in the Six Days War. They belonged to Jerusalem Brigade. Two elite troop brigades fight in Jerusalem in 1967. One is the 55th Paratroopers Brigade entering from the eastern part of the city. The commander was Motagur, later chief of staff of the Israeli army. But the men who conquered Jerusalem, every single hill from the south all around the city seam line was the Jerusalem Brigade. The men gave their life for the city. You didn't hear about them probably because the new defense ministry nominated three days before the war took the image and the honor of that victory, Moshe Dayan. In fact, the real commander of that fight, General Amitai, was the man, but these are humble fighters, they were not looking for prestige. And it seems that public opinion in the world and Jewish public opinion was looking for someone of that new generation who looked like Moshe Dayan. So you remember these days. This is a mosque, minaret, which has been built over King David's grave. And you can see how these religions, religions are imbricated. And here you can see the 800 years old roofs of the yeshiva upon Mount Zion. The yeshiva dwelling Alan, are here. I'm sure you are here watching us from Australia, from the States. You see these amazing roofs in Jerusalem. But this was invented 800 years ago for air circulation. This was the solution we found in those days for air conditioning. Hot air in the room was rolling through this arch through this dome and the dome was white and fresh and you can pay attention behind you that most Jewish homes in Jerusalem Middle Ages had this Ten Commandment tablet shaped window. This is specific to Jerusalem and this is for me to this very day to remember to identify what was a Jewish property. I will show you later how we identify a Christian property and a Muslim property because everyone put on his home, on his building, on his body as well, the sign of his identity. A proud Christian, a proud Muslim, a proud Jew, each one carries his identity with him. Times are changing and we are now in a global world economy and people look the same, I know. But in Jerusalem, it has certain charm you Muslim, respect me for being a Jew. I respect you for being a Muslim. I respect you the way you are. You can sleep with you your own identity. And you can see the people walking down there. They are literally close by the grave of King David. I would like to take you to the inner courtyard, which is behind the gravestone. Of course, we will not come in the room with the camera because this is not this. And do you have any question? Would you like to make some prayers Eventually, we can pray for the sake of people. We will light a candle. We will pray.
because King David will give birth to the Messiah, but today, close to God, is acting for a better life among human beings. My intuition tells me, Alan, that you are enjoying this day very much. Am I right? It's excellent. It's very informative. It has to be. Listen, our guest all over the world woke up very early. Our guest woke up very early in order to make sure. They woke up very early in order to make sure that they'll be able to tour with us this beautiful tour. By the way, if you pay attention to this staircase here, here used to be Masonic, Freemason's emblem. Someone took them away recently. Why? I don't know, but the Freemasons all over the world refers to Jerusalem temple, to the building of the temple, and to moral ethics connected with the temple. Let's walk towards King David's grave. I'm waiting for you here, okay? So as I'm getting approaching you, we will be able to view this room where people are coming and praying, you can listen to them. These are Hasidim. They pray here day and night and keep the place. King David was playing music instruments and he was writing songs. Do we have any question? I rem remind you all over the world in this uh, direct broadcast right now from Jerusalem, please ask your question, we will answer on real time, on the spot if you just SMS email to us. So this courtyard was built by the Crusaders and this became a meditation cloister around the grave. And here in that little room here is buried King David you hear them? And behind this wall people light candles. These are candles, and here people light candles, and people pray. I would like to pray for all those who are sick, for all those who suffer on his specific day. I have to be personal, as we are from Peretz family, which is the family of King David, 
and my dear uncle passed away yesterday and not buried yet and I would like to say for him in front of this candles in front of King David uh, Kaddish as he is a descendant of King David and he has been a man bringing happiness around him all his life Amen. <laughs> Kaddish for Maimon ben Shimon and for all those who passed away we are one week before Passover here next to King David's grave here is a Muslim graveyard surrounded by the Jewish yeshiva, by the church we just have seen. As you see, Middle East, the land of Israel, by far, more interesting than what it appears to be when we watch at it from the news. We are going to walk together now down the slopes, the north, the southern slopes of Mount Zion.